And ladies and gentlemen, now we'd like to start. Welcome to come to the uh, a conference of world, uh, 100 years of world wars. Um, good afternoon in Japan and good evening in the United States and perhaps in the midnight in a, uh, Europe. <laughs> So welcome to join to the World War, uh, Worldwide International Online Conference on 100 of World Wars and post-war regional collaboration and good governance. How to make a new world order. My name is Kumiko Haba, opening remarks and chair, professor of Aoyama Gakuin University and associate member of Science Council of Japan. This conference is organized by Science Council of Japan, Committee of Area Studies, Subcommittee of Asian Regional Cooperation and Academic Network Con Construction, and Committee of Economics. Co-sponsored by Aoyama Gakuin University, EU European Commission, Erasmus Mundus Fund, uh, JASPUS Fund, Japan India Bilateral Academic Cooperation Fund, Kyoto University Institute of Economics, CHIR Commission of History of International Relations, Paris and Milano. Sponsorship is Asahi Shimbun. We appreciate to use the Zoom webinar by ASTEM company, Osaka. Thank you very much. At first, I'd like to ask welcome speech to President Aoyama Gakuin University, President Professor Hiroshi Sakamoto. Please, President Hiroshi Sakamoto. Thank you. え、青山学院大学学長の坂本と申します。え、共済校代表いたしまして皆様にご挨拶申し上げます。本来でしたら、え、このメイン会場で、え、皆様にお会いできるのを楽しみにしておりましたが、え、このような状況で、え、オンラ
隷属させる帝国の,あのインペリアリズムの元祖だという意味でもそういう評価をされることもあります。そういう古代史からもこの今回のテーマ興味深く拝聴させていただきたいと思っております。最初に皆様にこの会場でお会いできるのを楽しみにしておりますと申し上げました。このコロナ禍が収まったパンデミックが落ち着いた後にぜひ皆様この青山学院大学にお越しいただきたくお願いいたしますそれでは皆様どうぞよろしくお願いいたしますパクス・ロマナ。But in that had people 
subordinated to the empire and emperor. So from this kind of research interest from the ancient history, I'm really looking forward to learning all the wonderful presentations and discussions in this conference. When this pandemic will be over, it is my great honor to invite all of you to visit Aoyama Gakuen University. I hope you enjoy all the wonderful academic meetings and I wish to express my heartfelt gratitude again for the success of the excellent conference. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So the next presentation, welcome speech from Professor Yamagiwa. He is a past president of SCG, Science Council of Japan. Please, a Professor Yamagiwa, thank you. Hello, everybody. It is indeed a great honor for me to be given this opportunity to address you on the occasion of this special meeting. I have served as the president of Science Council of Japan, that is SCJ, until this September. SCJ was established in 1949 from the reflection that the Japanese scientists were involved in the World War II. The following year, SCJ adopted a statement on its commitment to never become engaged in scientific research for war purposes. And in 1967, issued again the same statement. Behind this statement, there existed remorse for the scientist community's past cooperation with war efforts and a deep concern for a possible resurgence of similar situations. In recent years, however, the distance between scientific research and military endeavors has been narrowing again. In 2015, the acquisition technology and logistics agency of the military of defense started a research funding program called National Security Technology Research Promotion, in which research proposals are invited and reviewed with the clear objective of awarding pros prospective projects, which are likely to produce results useful to the future development of um, defense equipment. Therefore, by recognizing the tension between two sides, SCJ affirmed the previous two statements three years ago and requested academic societies and other communities to develop guidelines depending upon the characteristics of their respective disciplines and fields. As to appropriateness of the research, a shared understanding should be formed within the scientist community based on cumulative academic deliberations and judgments. Sincere discussions should be ongoing among not only respective scientists, but also universities, research institutions, academic societies, and the scientist community as a whole, and should be open to the rest of society. At that time, I served as the president of Kyoto University. Our university's mission statement expresses the university's aim to sustain and develop its historical commitment to academic freedom and pursue harmonious coexistence within the world's human and ecological community by generating world-class knowledge through freedom and aut autonomy in research that confirms with high ethical standard. The university's research activities are undertaken with the aims 
of increasing the safety of society and contributing to human well-being and peace. Therefore, we decided that no one at the university is permitted to be involved in military research that threatens those aims. If concerns arise that any research activities do not comply with the policy, a standing committee established by the president will investigate each case individually. Many universities have made the same decision until present. Ministers of Defense and some politicians of the Japanese government and ruling party did not welcome this decision and often complain that SCJ obstruct academic freedom with this statement. However, academic freedom should be based on ethics of scientists decided by themselves freely from political power. But now it is a worrying situation. At the end of September this year, when the half of SCJ members are resurrected, the Prime Minister Suga did not appoint six members of social scientists, sciences, and humanities against the convention. Successive Prime Ministers have never intervened in the recommendation of members of SCJ. I requested him to explain the reason of his action immediately, but he has not clarified the reason until today. I'm afraid that social scientists having opinions against the government policy and are going to be eliminated without explanation. Scientists are not politicians, but are having diverse opinions in their specialized fields sometimes against the government's direction. Diversity is a foundation of democracy and opens new avenues for our future possibilities. If the governments intervene the selection system of SCJ, autonomy of academic society and academic freedom with mutual trust among scientists will be broken. This situation is a crisis of democracy and existence of SCJ. I sincerely hope all of you to support our request for renomination of six members by the Prime Minister Suga. We will continue this effort. Lastly, I hope all the participants to enjoy hot discussion at this symposium and to get fruitful results for the future. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, um, past president Yamagiwa, uh, excellent presentation. Um, he was a president until this September. Uh, so after that, uh, only uh, two months uh, passed uh, after his, uh, fin he finished the, uh, his position. And now there is a little uh, problematic in uh, uh, SCJ, so that's why he explained about that, but it is most important thing to consider about what is uh, what is academy and what is our research and so on. Thank you very much. So, um, yes, and <laughs> I'd like to explain one more. Uh, his high, uh, back screen is uh, African jungle because he's a researcher of orangutan and monkey and the uh, highest level professor uh, researching about that things. So that's why he showed the Amer uh, African jungle as well. Thank you very much. So now I'd like to ask the uh, welcome speech from uh, Professor Mizobata. He is also the um, SCJ member and uh, uh, rector of uh, Institute of Economics, University of Kyoto, Kyoto University. Thank you very much, Professor Mizobata. Okay, hello everybody. So my name is Satoshi Mizobata, Professor of Kyoto Institute of Economic Research at Kyoto University. Uh, Professor Yamagawa is my former boss. 
Okay. And uh, as a uh, former uh, director of Trinity and uh, SCJ member, uh, I would like to make a, a welcome speech quickly. So, and first of all, it's uh, honorable and uh, great pleasure to organize the international conference online. And uh, I'd like to express my gratitude to all the participants. And uh, even though under the COVID-19, we obliged to postpone our schedule and to change the story to uh, online version. Uh, I believe this conference uh, becomes a good medicine for researchers. And uh, of course, I would like to express my deepest appreciation to the organizer, Professor Haba, and her concern uh, for the energy preparation of the conference. And uh, after nine months uh, post moment, uh, even now we are facing the very severe uh, st stage of pandemic. And uh, but uh, the, uh, the contemporary uh, so, uh, world uh, political situation looks uh, to be deteriorating. So we can find out a clue to solve the conflict over uh, China-US conflict, uh, Middle East problems, uh, Russian problems, and Asian problems. So on the contrary, the situation has become pressing uh, due to breaking off uh, international travel under the COVID-19. And the key concept, one of the key concepts of the conference uh, is new world orders. And uh, I believe the con uh, concept has strengthened its values and importance this year. And I strongly hope that the conference will make a contribution for mutual uh, understanding and all the participants enjoy the uh, conference for three days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Mizobata. Uh, excellent uh, presentation, welcome speech. So now I'd like to explain the prospects, the purpose of the event. 100 years of world wars and post-war regional collaboration and good governance, how to make a new world order. It is already explained by uh, Professor Mizobata as well. The world is currently at the major turning point under the crisis of COVID-19. The 100 years pandemic has hit the world infecting near 65, uh, 65 million people and dying nearly 1.5 million people, awfully. According to WHO, already 10% of the world's population is infected. It is almost 10 times more, 700 million. So it is a really awful situation in the world. Just 100 years ago, a plague struck the world, the Spanish flu. This time, the United States, Europe, Latin America, Asia, India especially, and all over the world had been a great damage. The world is in pain, and we hope that many people will recover as soon as possible and that effective vaccines will be developed as soon as possible as well. The 20th century was a century of world wars. Two world, war, two world wars occurred and the Cold War ruled the world after the two world wars. Amidst the post-war devastation, the European community under the Roman, uh, Rome Treaty and European Union under the Maastricht Treaty was formed in Europe. Europe has created peaceful governance by building economic collaboration, institution, and establish, establishing the rule of law, especially after the Second World War. In Asia, ASEAN also pursued regional good governance after World War II. However, there is a new nationalism 
in the contemporary world, populism is spreading in Europe, even in Europe, the US, the Trump government, Latin America, and Asia as well. There is a wave of rapid economic growth in rising countries, especially in China and India. Destabilization in search of democratization is spreading simultaneously in East Asia, East South Asia, South Asia, Middle East, North Africa, Central Africa, anywhere. But it uh, doesn't make peace until now. It makes uh, instability here. So in this field, based on the three wars in the 20th century, World War I, World War II, Cold War, what kind of regional institutionalization and regional good governance have been built up to avoid endless war and conflicts? We will examine and consider what kind of order is needed to establish, uh, to stabilize the conflict regions among both Europe, Asia, and Latin America and Africa. The theme of the Tokyo and Kyoto conference organized by SCG, Science Council of Japan, Aoyama Gakuin University, Kyoto University, are to investigate and clarify how the countries that experienced the world wars have considered regional coexistence in each period and each region and how to establish peace, stability, and prosperity under institutions and rule of law. We'd like to organize the Tokyo and Kyoto conference and discuss post-war regional cooperation and good governance in this transitional period. UN's SCJ is also a very important model to make a good governance and peace and stability. We hope many scholars and young researchers will join us and discuss how to make new world orders from these unstable periods of COVID-19 and nationalism, populism investigate, analyze, and discuss together to make a peaceful world. Please join us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So now we'd like to start with a very important speakers of keynote speech, um, two excellent speakers, one is a Dr. Glenn S. Fukushima from the United States of America, solely in the midnight. And the other is a rector of United Nations University, David Malone, Dr. David Malone. Thank you very much. So at first, please, uh, yeah, presentation, uh, keynote speech, Dr. Glenn Fukushima. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Haba, for the very generous introduction. Uh, and thank you also for uh, Professor Haba and uh, the organizers, uh, including the uh, Science Council of Japan, Kyoto University, Aoyama Gakuin University, and others for uh, inviting me to speak at this important conference and to share my views with this distinguished audience. <clears throat> I'm honored to be invited to join the podium with many prominent speakers, including my good friend, Ambassador David Malone, a highly distinguished and experienced diplomat. Uh, let me say at the outset that I'm an American with a longstanding interest in American foreign policy and America's role in the world. But today I'm speaking purely as an individual, not representing any particular organization, political party or individual other than myself. So the topic I've been asked to address today, <clears throat> America's role in the new global order, 
is a uh, rather difficult one uh, for several reasons. Uh, number one, uh, we in the United States have just had a hotly contested presidential election uh, just one month ago on uh, November 3rd. Uh, the results uh, were not known until the, uh, four, the 7th of uh, November, four days later. Uh, but this uh, election will result in a change of political leadership on January 20th, 2021. So we are currently in the middle of a two and a half month transition period from the uh, Trump administration to the uh, Biden administration. Now, most observers believe, and I do as well, that the president-elect, former Vice President Joe Biden, will pursue a significantly different foreign policy and engage with the world in a significantly different way than that pursued over the past four years by President Donald Trump. But it is difficult at this early stage, uh, it's two months before the new administration is taking office, to know just how different it will be. Uh, here in Washington, there's a lot of discussion and debate about uh, this pr precise subject. Uh, second, <clears throat> President-elect Biden and his cabinet may have clear aspirations regarding which policies to pursue and which direction to lead the country, but they are likely to face serious constraints domestically. And thirdly, President-elect Biden will face a world that has changed significantly since he stepped down as President of Barack Obama's vice president on January 20th, 2017, because much has happened in the past four years. So any attempt to return to the pre-Trump world will be unrealistic. So let me uh, begin by discussing each of these uh, three aspects that I just mentioned. First, the aspirations of the new administration, secondly, the domestic constraints, and then thirdly, the global environment that's changed. So first, with regard to the aspirations of the new administration, on November 24th, President-elect Biden held a press conference to announce his senior foreign policy team. Susan Thomas Greenfield, who will be nominated as the next US ambassador to the United States said, quote, America is back, multilateralism is back, and diplomacy is back, close quote. So Ms. Thomas Greenfield's nomination represents three factors that President-elect Biden values, expertise, experience, and diversity. Ms. Thomas Greenfield, who is African-American and from Louisiana, joined the US State Department as a career foreign service officer in 1982 and served with distinction as a diplomat for 35 years before she was terminated in 2017 by the Trump administration. Her nomination is seen by many Americans as reflecting President-elect Biden's desire to show that women of color and expertise and experience should be provided the same opportunities as that provided to white males, that professionalism is to be rewarded, and that America's government officials should, quote, look like America, close quote. The nomination of Alejandro Mayorkas as the Secretary of Homeland Security is another indication of Biden's emphasis on expertise, experience, and diversity. Mr. Mayorkas immigrated to the United States from Cuba as a child, earned a law degree, worked on immigration issues in the Obama administration when he headed the US Citizenship and Information Services, and was one of the principal architects of the DACA, that is Deferred Action for Childhood Program, uh, Childhood Arrivals Program. This program, which President Trump has tried to eliminate throughout his presidency, gives unauthorized immigrants who came to the United States as minors temporary relief from deportation and the right to work. President-elect Biden's choice of Tony Blinken as Secretary of State and of Jake Sullivan as Director of the National Security Council shows that the Biden administration's foreign policy will be led by professionals with extensive experience, deep, deep expertise, and personal relationships developed around the world. The fact that both of them have worked in previous administrations in the NSC and the State Department is important since both institutions have been severely weakened over the past four years. The number of senior foreign uh, career foreign officers in the uh, State Department uh, who have left in the last four years is largest in recent history 
and the fact that we have had four directors uh, of the National Security Council in four years is unprecedented. Now, many of you are familiar with President-elect uh, President Biden's article entitled, Why America Must, Must Lead Again, Rescuing U.S. Foreign Policy After Trump. This was published in the March-April 2020 issue of Foreign Affairs Magazine, which is the publication of the Council on Foreign Relations. So I know that many of you are already familiar with this, so I will not dwell on it at length. However, for the benefit of those of you who have not read it, let me quickly summarize the main points. The article begins with uh, President-elect Biden writing, quote, by nearly every measure, the credibility and influence of the United States and the world have diminished since President Barack Obama and I left office on January 20th, 2017, close quote. He goes on to write, quote, the next US president will have to address the world as it is in January, 2021, and picking up the pieces will be an enormous task. He or she will have to salvage our reputation, rebuild confidence in our leadership, and mobilize our country and our allies to rapidly meet new challenges. As president, I will take immediate steps to renew US democracy and alliances, protect the United States economic future, and once more have America lead the world, close quote. He argues in this article that first, quote, we must repair and reinvigorate our own democracy, close quote. His famous formulation uh, that's been quoted many times since then is, quote, the United States is prepared to lead again, not just with the example of our power, but also with the power of our example, close quote. He writes that in his first year in, the off in office, the United States will, quote, organize and host a global summit for democracy to renew the spirit and shared purpose of the nations of the free world. It will bring together the world's democracies to strengthen our democratic institutions, honestly confront nations that are backsliding and forge a common agenda, close quote. Second, in this article, Biden asserts that, quote, my administration will equip Americans to succeed in the global economy with a foreign policy for the middle class. Economic security is national security. Our trade policy has to start at home by strengthening our greatest asset, our middle class, and making sure that everyone can share in the success of the country, no matter one's race, gender, zip code, religion, sexual orientation, or disability, close quote. Now this concept of a foreign po policy for the middle class is something that uh, is explained in considerable detail in a report that the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace published on September 23rd of this year. Basically, this um, study is a study of um, three states of the United States in the heartland of America, uh, Colorado, Ohio, and Nebraska. And the attempt is to see what the Americans living in these three states expect from a foreign policy for the United States. And um, these three states are in a sense, similar in, in that they're all in the heartland of America, but they're also diverse in various ways. And uh, in this past election, two of them, Ohio and Nebraska, voted for President Trump, and one, Colorado, goes, voted for uh, Vice, former Vice President Biden. This issue of um, the foreign policy for the middle class, I think, is something that will play a central role in the uh, foreign policy of the, Bush, of the uh, Biden administration. Third, in this article, the uh, foreign, foreign affairs article, Biden discusses countries and issues he views as high priorities, including restoring partnerships with allies and partners, competing with China and Russia, and addressing issues including climate change, non-proliferation, and nuclear security, and technologies of the future. He concludes his article with the following paragraph, quote, we must once more harness that power and rally the free world to meet the challenges facing the world today. It falls to the United States to lead the way. No other nation has that capacity. No other nation is built on that idea. We have to champion liberty and democracy, reclaim our credibility, and look with unrelenting optimism and determination toward the future." Close quote. Now, especially to a non-US audience, uh, it's important to put this article in context, since it may sound rather American-centric, overly optimistic, and perhaps a bit arrogant. 
First, it's important to realize that this article was written in late 2019 during the US presidential campaign when the Democratic Party had a total of up to 28 candidates running for the presidency. This means it was important for candidate Biden at that time to distinguish himself from other candidates by emphasizing his expertise and long involvement in foreign policy, including serving as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Second, the article exuded such optimism in part because it was written before the coronavirus pandemic uh, became a visible crisis in the United States in the spring of this year, before the pandemic devastated the American economy, and before the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis in July sparked nationwide protest against the American criminal justice system and systemic racism expressed in the Black Lives Matter movement. Since the fall of this year, uh, candidate Biden has been clear in stating that if elected president, his priority would be one, to control the pandemic, first and foremost. His second priority would be to revitalize the economy based on the comprehensive economic plan announced in July of this year, uh, named, quote, Build Back Better. And another priority would be to address the issues of structural inequality and systemic racism in the United States. Another priority, which remains constant from his foreign affairs article, is the issue of climate change. So as you can see, President-elect Biden and his administration-to-be have great aspirations for conquering the coronavirus, revitalizing the American economy, reducing structural inequalities and systemic racism, combating climate change, and restoring America's role in the world. However, as I mentioned earlier, they will face significant challenges in achieving these goals, uh, both domestic and foreign. So first, the domestic constraints. The US election for the White House of November 3rd produced a clear win for the Democratic Party with former Vice President Biden winning 306 electoral votes to 232 electoral votes for President Biden for President Trump. In the popular vote, Biden won more than 80 million votes, over 6 million votes more than President Trump. However, contrary to the optimistic forecast based on public opinion polls, uh, quite a few of which were wrong, as they were in 2016, Democrats did not realize a blue wave where Democrats were hopeful of winning not only the White House, but gaining seats in the House and flipping the Senate to a Democratic majority. Instead, Democrats on November 3rd lost seats in the House of Representatives and failed to gain a majority in the Senate. The final outcome of the Senate elections will not be known until the runoff elections in Georgia set for January 5, 2021. But which party wins a majority in the Senate will have important implications for the Biden administration on two counts. First, winning a majority in the Senate will be important for Biden to get past the legislation he wants. Both Obama and Trump did by executive order what they felt they could not, were not able to do because they couldn't get, good, get legislation passed by the Congress. But there are limits to what can be done by executive order rather than through legislation passed by both houses of Congress. And this would be difficult if the Democrats, uh, although maintaining the House, uh, are not, is not able to gain a majority in the Senate. Second, having a friendly Senate will be important for Biden to get confirmed the senior officials he wants in his administration, the cabinet secretaries, deputy secretaries, undersecretaries, assistant secretaries, and ambassadors as well as federal judges to the Supreme Court, 13 circuit courts of appeal, and 94 federal district courts. As you probably know, in the uh, US system, unlike uh, most systems in the world, when a new administration comes into office, 4,000 new people come in at senior levels in the government. And of the 4,000, about 1,200 require Senate confirmation. And uh, the... Uh, uh, if, if the Senate is the same party as the president, uh, it makes it easier for the president to get his uh, people confirmed. And if the Senate is of the other party, uh, it makes it more difficult. So the first domestic constraint pre President Trump will face is the Republican party, especially if it retains a majority in the Senate. When Barack Obama assumed the presidency in January of 2009, 
Senator Mitch McConnell, then and still now the Senate Majority Leader, declared that the goal of the Republican should be to ensure that Obama end up as a one-term president. And Senator McConnell, true to his word, did everything he could to prevent President Obama from realizing his agenda. Now, many Americans are hopeful that because President-elect Biden has so much experience in Washington, D.C., having served as senator for 36 years and as vice president for eight years, and because of his personality, his decency, and his empathy, that he will be able to work with Republicans to, to uh, come to compromises and to uh, get things done, including passing legislation. Some also point to Biden's personal relationships with prominent Republicans, including Mitch McConnell. But it will still be a difficult task if the Senate uh, remains under a, a Republican majority. So the first challenge for domestic challenge for Biden in the administration will be the Republican Party and the, and the Congress. The second domestic constraint for President Biden will be uh, the fact that although he won more than 80 million votes, almost 74 million voters elected to keep President Trump in power for a second term. So pre uh, President-elect Biden has repeatedly said, quote, I'm a good Democrat, I'm a proud Democrat, but as president, I will govern America, not only those who voted for me, close quote. But the reality is that America is a deeply divided country. Some say uh, more, the, more divided than at any time since the Civil War of the mid 1800s. As a gross generalization, the West Coast, East Coast and large cities favor the Democrats while the Midwest, South and rural areas favor the Republicans. And, and when one looks at the uh, electoral system of the United States, including the Electoral College, uh, the Electoral College does favor uh, the Republican Party. Uh, when we examine in more detail the voting behavior of the electorate, we see that in addition to the geographic region and urban rural distinction, there are also clear differences based on race, gender, generation, religion, income, and education. Now these differences have in recent years become exacerbated by cable television and social media. Whereas 30 years ago, the main sources of television news in the United States were the three major networks of ABC, CBS, and NBC, which by, by and large agreed, at least on the facts, what the facts were. We now see a proliferation of cable and other networks, many of which have a completely different narrative or view of the world from the others. It is indeed a world of quote unquote, alternative facts. And social media adds to the polarization since the algorithms employed to keep users hooked to the screen to see various advertisements ensure that the users are fed the political viewpoint that he or she favors. So those users who have democratic views are often fed news and features from the left, whereas those users who have Republican views are fed news and features from the right, further increasing the polarization. The third domestic constraint that President Biden will face is Donald Trump himself. At this point, no one knows for sure what role Trump will play after he leaves the White House on January 20th, 2021. On one extreme, he may decide that he's had enough of politics and he may decide to focus his energies on business, including paying off the more than $400 million of debts that he reportedly owes. On the other extreme, he may decide to keep actively involved in the political world, not only by continue, continuing his daily tweets, but also perhaps by starting or acquiring a media network since he appears to feel alienated from Fox News, which he used to consider a close uh, supporter. If this last scenario comes to pass, and if Trump is serious about wanting to run again for the presidency in 2024, this could impose another constraint on what President Biden could do both domestically and internationally. Now, some people point out that President Trump, after he leaves the presidency, will no longer be immune from various legal uh, challenges, uh, lawsuits that he would have come under had he not been president. Uh, so it is possible that uh, once he becomes a, uh, a regular citizen leaving the White House, that uh, he may be subject to many lawsuits and this may um, interfere with his uh, uh, plans to uh, stay engaged in politics, but we don't really know uh, for certain yet what's going to happen. So I've discussed the three political, constra the three constraints domestically that the Biden administration will face. And so let me now talk about the global 
environment. The world that President Biden will face in January 2021 will be, will be significantly different, obviously, from that he left as vice president four years before. America's two major rivals, China and Russia, are in a comparatively stronger position than they were in January 2017. Uh, the situation in Iran, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, North Korea, the Middle East have not necessarily improved and in some cases have worsened. America's alliances and partnership, including with NATO, have become frayed. And America's withdrawn from the Paris Climate Accord, Iran nuclear deal, or the JCPOA, World Health Organization, Trans-Pacific Partnership, and other international organizations and obligations. And although the Biden administration may declare that, quote, America is back, close quote, how will America's allies and partners react to this? Some will welcome America re-engaging with the world and with the multilateralism and international organizations that the Biden administration says it will uh, value. Others, however, will clearly be skeptical where the United States can be trusted to be consistent and whether it will have the staying power to keep its engagements and commitments around the world. The view would be if Donald Trump won in 2016, what assurance is there that another Donald Trump, either himself or someone else who touts his America first policies won't be elected as president in 2024 or 2028. On this issue, I find several developments encouraging and especially as someone who has worked not only in the United States and Asia, but also in Europe, having uh, been the head of Airbus uh, in Japan for eight years. Um, some of the uh, positive um, encouragement I'm finding is especially from, from Europe. Uh, first, uh, regarding the world's reception of the Biden administration, I was, I've been encouraged that in November, in November 16th issue of the Washington Post, the foreign ministers of Germany and of France co-authored an op-ed piece entitled, quote, Joe Biden can make transatlantic unity possible. So they wrote uh, in this joint article that the uh, foreign minister of France and Germany wrote, uh, quote, Europe and America need a transatlantic new deal to adapt our partnership to global upheavals and in line with the depth of our bonds, common values and shared interests. What is at stake is our ability to preserve our way of life and to pursue our never ending quest for individual freedom and collective progress. There won't be any better closer and more natural partner for this than America and Europe." Close quote. Four days later, on November 20th, European Commissioner President Ursula von der Leyen gave a major address to the US Council on Foreign Relations, which I attended in which she opened by praise, praising President-elect uh, Biden as a, quote, committed transatlanticist, close quote, and expressing satisfaction that, quote, we now have a friend in the White House, close quote. Uh, President von der Leyen proposed that the United States and Europe forge a, quote, new global alliance, close quote, focused on four areas, quote, number one, overcoming the global pandemic, including the development and distribution of vaccines, Number two, protecting climate and the environment based on, in part on the European Green Deal. Number three, governing the digital economy and technology, including human-centric artificial intelligence, and jointly writing the global rules to protect shared values and democracy. And number four, upholding and upgrading international institutions and governance, including reforming the global trading system to deal with China as an economic competitor and systemic rival. The EC president reiterated that the four areas she cited were merely the core of a renewed transatlantic agenda and that many other issues are ripe for mutual cooperation between the United States and Europe. And on November 23rd, uh, just a few days later, former Mexican foreign minister, Jorge Castaneda published an op-ed piece in the Washington Post entitled, quote, Biden can inspire Latin America, close quote. He wrote, quote, Mr. Biden inspires Latin America by advocating the values the United States should stand for, human rights, democracy, fighting corruption, managing climate change. He can inspire Latin Americans 
who have always embraced, embraced multilateralism by returning to multilateralism, whether it is to be, it is to institutions or to values, close quote. So clearly the global challenges confronting the new administration are daunting, as are the tasks requiring immediate attention at home. The optimists in America say, quote, we can walk and chew gum at the same time, close quote, meaning American can devote the necessary time, attention and resources to both the domestic and global issues. On the other hand, some pessimists are prone to say that the United States lacks the bandwidth to do both well, and that rather than spreading ourselves too thin and doing both badly, we should devote ourselves to fixing our domestic problems and doing that well. So let me uh, come to a conclusion since I'm running out of time and say that I personally come in somewhere between the optimists and the pessimists. Uh, perhaps uh, I would say I'm an optimistic realist. Uh, this may stem from the fact that I grew up in California. I attended elementary school in San Francisco in the San Francisco Bay Area, attended high school in Los Angeles and college at Stanford University uh, located next to Silicon Valley. And some of you know, <clears throat> California, which is the largest state in the United States by population, has a population of roughly 40 million people, about 15% of the population of the entire United States. It is now the world's fifth largest economy, uh, surpassing the United States, uh, United Kingdom and India. And only uh, on economic scale uh, coming after the United States, China, Japan, and Germany. California is also considered the harbinger or the kind of uh, web, uh, front runner uh, and indicator of the future of the rest of the United States. Uh, it's often been said over the last, in the post-war period, that California is uh, ahead of the rest of the United States by anywhere from 20 to 30 years. And what happens in California will be adopted by, many of the things in California will be adopted by the rest of the country uh, within 20 to 30 years. And when one looks at California and its policies on such issues as trade, immigration, environment, climate change, gun safety, civil rights, engagement with the world, these are all completely the opposite of what the Trump administration has tried to pursue in the four years in office. It is an op America that is uh, open, tolerant, diverse, dynamic, innovative, and actively engaged with the world in trade, investment, tourism, education, et cetera. It's an America from which our vice president elect Kamala Harris comes. Uh, Kamala Harris, uh, her mother immigrated to the United States from India. Her father immigrated to the United States from Jamaica. And they met when they were both graduate students studying at the University of California at Berkeley. To me personally, uh, Kamala Harris represents the future of the United States. The first woman to be vice president, the first black to be vice president, and the first Asian to be vice president. So although in the short term, America will be confronted with many challenges, both domestic and foreign. In the longer term, I'm optimistic about the future of America and the potential it has to play a positive and constructive role in the world. Uh, I therefore hope that the participants in this conference will join me in viewing the United States uh, in this longer term perspective. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'd be happy to uh, entertain any questions you might have. Thank you. I think you need to unmute yourself. I can't, I can't hear you. Sorry. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Glenn Fukushima. Uh, it is really informative and excellent presentation. Uh, until now, we don't have a question and an answer. Please write our audiences and panelists, uh, write a question uh, in a below button. And um, uh, Azari has shortly he, to write your question. And perhaps uh, uh, writing audiences, writing the questions, I'd like to ask a very short question, two questions. One is a domestic one. Um, a minority question, uh, especially uh, Black Lives Matter. 
you speak about the vice president is black and Asian, uh, but uh, for the people uh, of the black people, how is it possible Biden consider? Uh, so for example, Obamacare will coming back in the future and health care or such, what is uh, um, new policy toward black or Hispanic? This is the first question. And the second one is the international uh, uh, diplomacy, uh, especially uh, around in, uh, surrounding Japan, East Asia is the situation is very uh, tension, uh, serious tension. And especially now Australia and the United States consider about the Quad uh, military collaboration and Japan is also joining to containment policy against the China or so. So is it possible to change such a, a situation in Biden uh, government or uh, the policy toward the East Asia will continue in the future as well? Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for those two excellent questions. They're both very important questions and, uh, and difficult questions. First, on domestic policy uh, and, and Black Lives Matter, I think that the uh, killing of George Floyd on July 25th has really um, uh, raised the issue of uh, criminal justice and also um, systemic racism to a very high level in uh, the United States. And uh, I think that President elect Biden uh, considers these issues to be very serious. I think that's part of the reason actually that he's committed to nominating to the US Supreme Court a uh, African-American woman at the first opportunity. Also, I think it partly behind his uh, reasoning for selecting uh, Kamala Harris to be vice president. And also uh, he, uh, you know, part of, the reason he was actually able to, to uh, win the presidency was that in, um, it was really the key date was uh, February 29th of this year, the South Carolina primary. After candidate Biden lost the uh, caucuses in uh, Iowa, lost the uh, uh, primary in New Hampshire, lost the caucuses in Nevada after three successive losses it was the primary in South Carolina where he made his comeback. And that South Carolina primary where he won was uh, due in large part to the African-American vote and also to Congressman Jim Clyburn from South Carolina who supported him publicly. And uh, so I think that we are likely to see uh, a number of uh, African-Americans in senior positions in the, uh, in, the, in the Biden administration. And uh, I think that he will devote uh, considerable attention to address these, these issues of uh, structural inequality and systemic racism. Your question about um, the Latino or Hispanic uh, community is, is a very complex one. And this time, there were many analysts in the United States who were surprised by the outcome of the vote. And that is that I think the public opinion polls, many of them showed that the Latino vote would go overwhelmingly in favor of uh, candidate Biden. And it is true that he won uh, probably 60% or more from the uh, Latino community. However, the Latino community in the United States is quite diverse. And so for instance, in Arizona, I think the Latinos are primarily from, uh, they're Mexican Americans and they helped to uh, have Biden win Arizona for the first time since 1996 uh, for a Democrat. Um, but in Florida, the Many of the Hispanics there are from Cuba and also Puerto Rico. And many of those from Cuba in particular, because the older generation left Cuba to escape from communism, they tend to be quite conservative and pro-Republican. And so the Hispanics in, in, in Florida actually voted for um, Trump much more than had been expected. And so the Latino vote is, is quite complicated. But, um, but anyway, this is something that I think we're going to see interesting developments in as the Latino community in the United States continues to diversify. Mm -hmm. On your second question about Asia, I think that the Biden administration, in addition to all the domestic issues, internationally, uh, there are many issues, but obviously China is the single most important 
foreign policy issue. Also, North Korea is a very important issue. So I think because of China and North Korea, Asia will be a very important regional area for the Biden administration. And I don't have enough time to go into all the differences between the Trump administration and the Biden administration with regard to Asia policy. But I think one key factor will be that a Biden administration will be much more systematic, much more strategic, and also work more closely with our allies and partners in dealing with China, in particular with the EU, with Japan, and with Australia, and perhaps with India as well. So I think we're likely to see a much more systematic and much more multilateral approach that the US will take towards Asia. I wish I had more time to go into this in more detail, but the Asia um, policy will be uh, a major difference, I think, from the Trump administration. Thank you very much. Very uh, detailed answer. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask from Professor Patrio, Patrick Voido, uh, is it possible to ask some question to Professor Gulen Fukushima? Voido sensei, kikoemasu ka? Professor Void. Well, anyone possible to ask Professor questions? Boyd has a yes. question he's I written. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank I'll you very much. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> What's your assessment of dominant view in today's Republic of the U.S. Front Alliance and U.S. Alliances in general? I think on the, so the question is, uh, what is your assessment of the dominant view in today's Republican Party on the U.S.-Japan alliance mm -hmm. and the U.S. alliance system generally? I think with the U.S.-Japan alliance, um, there is considerable um, agreement, bi uh, bipartisan agreement between Republicans and Democrats about the importance of the U.S.-Japan security alliance, security treaty, and the um, cooperative arrangements that we have between the United States and Japan uh, bilaterally, but also with regard to the, the region, uh, Asian region. Uh, now, with regard to the Republican Party, actually with regard to Republican, there are some, some differences in the sense that if you take kind of the traditional uh, Republican um, party view of Japan, I think many, in, in that group would be upset by the fact that the that Trump and his people um, <clears throat> have been uh, wanting to get Japan to increase by uh, fourfold, uh, at least or maybe fivefold, the amount of um, funds that Japan uh, contributes to the host nation support for having about 50,000 US forces stationed in Japan, primarily in Okinawa. And uh, so um, now that the, there's gonna be a, a, a change, a transition from the Trump administration to the Biden administration, uh, probably there will be a difference in the US um, request of Japan in terms of the uh, burden sharing. Uh, I, I think that my, my guess is that the Biden administration will not seek a fourfold increase in the, in the Japanese contribution to the uh, host nation support. Um, but I guess aside from that, I'm, I'm, well, but, but put it this way, if, if Trump had been reelected, I do think that there, there would have been a strong possibility that a Trump administration would have put considerably more pressure on Japan to, uh, first of all, increase those nation support. Secondly, increase the defense budget, because President Trump, as you know, has been telling the NATO countries at least 2%, if not 4% of GDP. And Japan, as you know, is less than 1%. So I think a Trump administration second term would have put more pressure on Japan to increase its defense expenditures. And number three, to buy more armaments from the United States. So I think those three would have been pretty clearly on the agenda for a second Trump administration. Uh, I don't think that uh, it'll be quite uh, to that extent in a, in a Biden administration. But, but I think the overall point is that uh, whether Republican or Democratic administration, the value of Japan as a security partner uh, and ally is unquestioned. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, time is almost finished, but there is one more question. Uh, it is very difficult to answer shortly, um, but I'd like to read it. Uh, how to deal with the unawful killing of Iranian uh, commander and scientist and pro-Israel pro drive during Trump administration? Can you answer very shortly? I, I didn't understand the last sentence. The, the, uh, so I understand the, the point about the the nuclear scientist that who was assassinated. Mm -hmm. uh, but what what is the last the last sentence is about Israel um, and and Trump? Israel drive pro Israel drive during Trump administration. It is written. So well, what's the word? You can you can say anything. Well, uh, you well, do not consider okay, so, the last so, sentence. <laughs> So it appears, based on what Iran has said, that they believe that Israel was behind this assassination of the nuclear scientist. Also, there is suspicion that the United States uh, at least knew about it, had been consulted, and perhaps even uh, cooperated in some way. And so I think many people, at least in the United States, are seeing this as um, certainly an attempt by Israel and perhaps uh, the Trump administration to make it difficult for the Biden administration to re-engage in the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. Because Biden has said throughout the campaign that if Iran agrees to the terms of the agreement uh, and the other parties uh, can agree, the US would rejoin that agreement and actually try to extend the, the term of the agreement. So that was what Biden has been saying and that's what he would like to do. Now with this assassination of the head of the nuclear program in I Iran, this clearly um, makes the situation much more difficult and complex. Um, and so I think there's a lot of speculation as to what Iran's reaction to this is going to be and uh, whether President Trump, uh, President Biden would be able to get Iran to the table to engage in negotiations to uh, restore an agreement to which uh, the US would engage again with Iran. So this really makes things much more complicated and that may have been the, the motivation behind it. So. I think clearly the the Biden foreign policy team is is um, is uh, seeing this as a is a major issue they have to contend with uh, very early on, and it just complicates the situation, makes it more difficult. But you know there's still almost two months left between now and January 20th when the transition ends, uh, and the new administration begins. And because there's been such a purge of senior officials in the Defense Department, including the Secretary of Defense. I think the defense people, including a senator that I was just talking to today, are very concerned about what might take place in the next six weeks or so that would further make it difficult for the Biden administration on foreign policy issues. So I think that there, there is a lot of concern and they're watching the situation very closely. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Glenn Fukushima in the midnight of the United States. Thank you very much, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, please, um, Professor uh, David Malone, a rector of uh, United Nations University. I'm sorry I waited so much uh, and uh, he is excellent. Uh, uh, organizer of the UN uh, researchers and uh, uh, many important uh, environment policy or uh, youth uh, um, training policy uh, or gender policy as well. So he will speak about the uh, SDGs in the United Nations and in the future of how to make a good governance and uh, new world order. Thank you very much, Professor David Malone. Thank you very much, Professor Haba. I hope you can hear me. Uh, uh, warm thanks to my friend, uh, Glenn Fukushima, 
uh, he was terrific. And my fond hope is that the new administration will recruit him into one of its top jobs dealing uh, with Asia, but particularly with Japan, because we all so much enjoy it when he comes to Japan and we get to catch up with him and learn about what's going on in Washington. And I learned a lot just now. Um, for those of you who are online and don't know the UN University very well, uh, you'll see on my screen backdrop, uh, there is uh, uh, a pyramidal structure and it represents the UN University building, which is opposite uh, uh, Aoyama Gakuin University on Aoyama Avenue in uh, uh, Tokyo. And so it's lovely uh, to be partnering with Professor Haba uh, for something of this nature. Um, I agree with absolutely everything uh, Dr. Fukushima said about the United States. So I will not speak too much about the United States, except to say that, and it's with great regret that I say it, that President Trump leaves uh, the White House with the United States diminished on the world stage. Uh, President Biden's election reassures the world, but he cannot stop where, uh, he cannot start where uh, President Obama left off. Mm -hmm. um, Trump has created a great deal of international wreckage. He has alienated many of the closest allies of the US. And uh, this is very unfortunate, not just for the US, but for countries like Japan, my own country, Canada, very close allies and warm friends of the United States uh, to see the United States in the position in which this irresponsible president uh, is leaving his country with very bad grace on top of everything else. Um, I should mention that I don't speak for the United Nations. I'm not a spokesman for the United Nations. In UNU's uh, constitution, which is a charter negotiated by the uh, General Assembly of the United Nations, we were granted absolute academic freedom. And when I uh, attend academic meetings and sometimes speak at them, I use that academic freedom to express myself truthfully and freely. Uh, so uh, that having been said, uh, and as the subject of our meeting really is order, uh, I thought I'd say that it's quite important to uh, think about order in different ways. People often think about order which is imposed by the parliament or it's imposed uh, by the United Nations Security Council perhaps, but actually most order is promoted in much more voluntary ways, both internationally and domestically within countries. Uh, so order is not primarily about the use of force uh, in order to establish or reestablish order. Uh, the, the use of force is quite often necessary and justified but it isn't the norm in uh, uh, promoting uh, order at the international level or the internal level within countries. It's mostly the exception. Uh, uh, in the case of the United Nations, uh, there was a collective uh, negotiation of many uh, independent countries at the end of the World War. Japan and the Allies were still at war, but uh, 
the European countries were already at peace. And it was an agreement amongst those countries participating, over 50% uh, percent of them, that created the United Nations. It wasn't as established by the order of the victorious powers at all. Uh, now, um, I think it helps uh, to think of order also being created by lawful processes or law-making processes. And in the United Nations, one form of order promoting activity is the negotiation of internationally uh, authoritative uh, treaties which are legally binding on those countries that sign and whose parliaments ratify those treaties. So this is not a coercive process about imposing order. It's about creating order uh, without use of force. And this is not always totally understood. And I thought I'd mention that. The Security Council of the United Nations can uh, authorize the use of force, but very rarely does. And it's right not to authorize it very often because in several cases recently where it authorized the use of force in exercising the mandate to use force, a number of countries exceeded the mandate. And the results were very bad. Think of Libya today, a country that is still at war these many years later, uh, because in large part of the excesses of the foreign interveners in that country, which unfortunately continue today. So um, in thinking about the United Nations, it helps to think of its activities in several different fields, peace and security. The UN Security Council does have a unique power in international law, which authorize coercive measures. Uh, they can be simply the use of military force. It can also be the imposition of economic or other sanctions on countries, but it uses these um, powers rarely, as I say, and is right to use them rarely. The UN is at its best when it creates a consensus amongst countries rather than when it divides countries. So I think this is more widely understood at the UN today than it was when the Cold War ended 30 years ago, and it was thought that the Security Council could direct the world. That turned out badly when that was attempted in the early 1990s. And I think the limitations of the United Nations need to be flagged here. And its powers to coerce should be used very, very sparingly, would be my conclusion as a student of UN activity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but there are many other things the UN has done successfully on, uh, uh, in the peace and security sphere, notably through treaty making in the arms control and disarmament field and in other fields. Uh, these activities, which are, uh, which member states participate in voluntarily uh, and either accept or don't accept to integrate into their domestic law, uh, are actually less dramatic than the use of force or the imposition of sanctions but often equally effective, if not more effective, over uh, a period of time. That's as much as I'm going to say about peace and security. 
Mm. Next area I want to um, mention is economic development. When the United Nations was created, there were developing countries. They were in the continents uh, of Latin America and uh, involved independent countries in Central America. They involved Mexico, for example. Um, uh, one or two countries in Asia, which had somehow maintained their independence throughout the era of colonization. Uh, Siam, today known as Thailand, would be uh, a case of that nature. Um, uh, China was a case in point, but there were very few. And in Africa, there was only uh, South Africa as a racist apartheid state, a few Arab states of Africa, and the Black African state of Liberia, uh, um, a country that had been created by slaves who were able to return from the United States or other countries to Africa. So very few developing countries in the UN when it was created. And so when the UN charter was negotiated, economic development of colonized countries was not very high on the agenda in truth. Uh, of course, Mexico, uh, Argentina, Chile, uh, these countries did advocate it but it didn't emerge as a central purpose of the UN. Rather, what emerged as a central purpose was the more general economic and social progress of mankind, all countries, not particularly developing countries. Uh, and this also led to a great deal of treaty making, notably uh, in the human rights sphere, but in many other spheres as well. And those treaties, uh, some of them have not turned out to be uh, widely subscribed by the membership, but others have been nearly universally signed and ratified and turn out to be central to our daily lives. Uh, in countries like Japan, the United States, or Canada, as well as the developing countries. Um, so a project like the Sustainable Development Goals, which responds primarily to the aspirations of developing countries while applying to all countries, uh, a project like that for the UN only became possible after the process of decolonization, the process of granting absolute freedom to the colonized countries um, was largely completed. And that happened between the years of roughly 1957 and 1965. In uh, only eight years, about 90 countries became independent one of the UN's great achievements, in fact, which is forgotten. Uh, because decolonization, which President Roosevelt had wanted, uh, was actually promoted above all within the United uh, Nations uh, system, as Roosevelt had hoped actually uh, would be the case. Mm -hmm. Roosevelt also was the primary force behind the creation of the UN. Churchill on his own would not have created the UN. He would have created something in the narrow interests of the United Kingdom. Uh, but Roosevelt, who was a man of extraordinarily ambitious uh, imagination and of very generous disposition, was a man who really will the United Nations to exist. And it was his widow, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was behind the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, from which nearly all human rights that we recognize today have flowed. 
a quite remarkable couple who Americans think of as remarkable Americans, but I think of as just extraordinary individuals who are citizens of the world as well as being American. Um, so uh, we could talk more about development in the question and answer period, but I do want to touch on two other areas that are important in the UN. The first is human rights, which I'd already mentioned in passing. What the UN contributed to the field of human rights, which individual countries had been struggling with since the French Revolution, uh, in uh, uh, 1789 uh, was that human rights came to be analyzed and codified through treaties, individual treaties and umbrella treaties. Mm -hmm. so the rights of women, the right to development, uh, the right to health, the right uh, any right we think of as a right uh, as citizens of the world largely has been codified within the UN, and that is a huge achievement of the United Nations system. Now, whether countries respect the human rights that they uh, agreed to respect is a different matter. Some countries do. Uh, Japan doesn't sign treaties it doesn't intend to implement, but other countries sign and ratify every available agreement without really thinking through whether they're going to be implementing them. And that's a problem in human rights uh, application rather than the creation of human rights at the normative level. Finally, I wanted to mention humanitarian action. Many people in the world aren't just poor. Many people in the world are hungry, sick because they are poor. They are distressed in a variety of ways. They lose their homes because of wars. They become refugees or other, adopt other forms of migration because of instability or as well as wars in countries. And the number of people in acute distress of this sort in the world today, beyond simply being very poor, is about 250 million, probably. Um, the UN counts 175 million or so of these people. But it also is always careful to say that there are many more that the UN has not been able to count. Uh, that's an awful lot of people in dire distress, hungry, without health care, without uh, anything, without shelter. And uh, the United Nations over the years has become increasingly active not as the leader of humanitarian action, the voluntary sector in many countries, including Japan, NGOs, we call them in English often, non-governmental organizations, uh, do a great deal of the work. What the UN does is raise a great deal of money for the work, $30 billion this year, probably. And it coordinates internationally and in fields of the deepest distress, the various humanitarian actors who are often uh, very good UN organizations like the World Food Program, which won the Nobel Peace Prize this year, or it could be um, a very good NGO like the International Red Cross system or um, um, the various health NGOs that make a huge difference around the world, of which the fam most famous is probably Doctors Without Borders. Finally, I wanted to say that for humanity, and the UN is the forum within 
which this issue is negotiated for humanity, the most urgent issue, whether we are rich or poor, is climate change. And I'm not going to speak about it. Japanese know enough about climate change to know how urgent it is. Their own country is seriously affected by climate change. We know that. And I'm going to stop here because discussion is more stimulating than being spoken at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. It is so profound questions and lectures. Thank you very much. It is very interesting. Um, perhaps uh, there is uh, from all over the world, uh, panelists came and uh, many uh, audience also came here, uh, more than 200 people. So anyone have questions? Uh, if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand or you can open the mute. Thank you. Yes, please. Professor Hanzawa, please. I have written in the, okay, I wasn't able to write in the question and answer section, so I wrote uh, my question in the chat right. section. If yes. you can have a look at it. Thank you. Uh, can you read, if possible, you by yourself? It might I can be. read it for you, if you like, because I have it in front of me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Pro Professor Hanzawa, for writing it in and, and joining us in person to mm -hmm. find it. Uh, he notes that there is a session on decolonization in the conference later today. Uh, can I identify, can I elaborate an uh, evaluation mm -hmm. impact of UNCTAD and of the new international economic order, uh, which stirred a great deal of enthusiasm when the professor and I were young, but we hear about less today. So just a sentence on each. UNCTAD was first a conference at the United Nations on trade and development, but it became a permanent secretariat to advocate on behalf of developing countries. Has it been effective? Yes and no. It depends on who's advocating and what is advocated. But is the UN better for having an UNCTAD? than it would have been without an UNCTAD? I think so, Professor, because it gives more voice to developing countries who often feel in the UN that their voice is not sufficiently heard or respected. The new international economic order was a project also of developing countries, not all of them, but most of them, to do exactly what the acronym says, create a different new economic order in which the interests of developing countries would be foremost or at least equal. Was it successful? It was not successful. Was it a good project? It was a good project. Not all good projects succeed. I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed. Is it okay, Professor Hanzawa? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, do you have any question, uh, Joy Peter Hudson? If you have a question, no? <laughs> or... If there aren't questions, uh... Uh, Professor Haba, because first of all, it's been my honor to be with you. Secondly, I benefited from listening to Professor Fukushima. I enjoyed preparing my remarks. And we are coming close to the time of the end of the session anyway. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, about the China and Indian position. Both are uh, rising power and uh, very effective to the UN uh, small developing countries, but uh, it also some uh, 
uh, fair from such a small countries, uh, small developing countries. So how do you think their role of China and India in the future uh, in the U UN or in the world? Well, I think both China and India have wanted to be, and both China and India have tried to be, good friends to mm -hmm. developing countries. Mm -hmm. They were very, very poor, both of them, uh, at the end of the Second World War. There, was, there had been starvation in both countries during the war. Mm -hmm. Their capacity to help other developing countries was limited, but they provided a great deal of moral leadership right. of the uh, de development movement. And mm -hmm. India helped create the non-aligned movement, uh, which gave political voice to developing countries and still has a considerable political voice at the UN. Mm -hmm. But you're right to hint very delicately, as you always do, uh, that as countries become more powerful, their attitudes change. They become more arrogant often. It's mm -hmm. China and India, in many countries, as they become more powerful, uh, they become more categorical uh, and they want to impose their views rather than simply articulate their views. Mm -hmm. um, and they also have economic interests in the developing world, just as they have interests in uh, the industrialized world. Both India and China are big investors in the industrialized world, as well as investing in the developing world. So their whole world outlook changes as they uh, they become more equal to the uh, rich industrialized countries. Uh, they invest more, unfortunately, in military instruments. And uh, so this changes a great deal. Now there is a significant difference between India and China, and that is the political systems of the two countries are quite different and mm -hmm. also culturally quite different. And this means that they are unlikely to see the world in exactly the same way and to promote their interests in the same way. And indeed, they share a long border, a very long border. And at the moment, they are engaged in uh, some uh, difficulty on their border with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is not unusual. It's not unduly alarming. But as developing countries develop, they will change and mm -hmm. they will want to be more powerful, and some of that power may or may not be expressed through military means. And uh, this worries other countries, but it is in a sense a natural outgrowth of the process of development, because once countries have the possibility mm -hmm. to do more uh, act, or to undertake more activities in a variety of different ways, they want to do that. So the world is changing, and overall it's changing much for the better. The development project has been quite successful. Very few people today, mm -hmm. ultra poor in the world today, compared to even 15 years ago. So this is huge progress, and both China and India have contributed enormously to that progress. What they now do with their increasing military power can create concern yeah. for neighbors, for each other, yeah. and for the world at large. So they have a responsibility with their new possibilities to yeah. behave responsibly. Mm. Stop there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, may I ask one more important question about For the sure. refugee, <laughs> refugee question? Now, um, 
almost 70 million refugees in the world and it is a half of the population of Japan and almost the same population now the COVID-19, I think. And refugees need to move from their country to more safe country. But nowadays, uh, moving is uh, infected to the uh, COVID-19. So that's why their position is very unstable and contradictory and difficult. How to, how to solve such a very serious situation? How to help from us or from the United Nations uh, to, to solve this very difficult question? Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, as a Canadian, I like to remember that modern Canada, uh, the colonization of Canada, was affected by people who were in desperate need in their countries of origin, ultra poor people in France, mm -hmm. uh, United Kingdom, some other European countries came to North America because they were the equivalent in those centuries of today's refugees. Mm -hmm. They did find refuge in North America, in the United States, in Canada. It was very difficult for them, but it was less difficult than it would have been had they stayed uh, in uh, abject hunger or died in illness from malnutrition in Europe. So many of the countries we think of today as successful countries were built out of the process of migration, moving from one region to another, one country to another. And usually that happened only because of dire distress in the country of origin. This is not always well understood in Japan. In Japan I think it is often thought if refugees are refugees, they may deserve to be refugees. And uh, we want to help them uh, relieve their misery, but we do not want them in Japan. Actually, uh, Japan may need refugees in the future with, because of its uh, negative demography. So mm -hmm. it would help everywhere in the world where many countries are suffering from negative demography. Mm -hmm. We think of refugees, first of all, as fellow human beings, just as deserving as ourselves of food, shelter, medical care, all the things we take for granted in Canada and Japan. But secondly, that we may actively need these people in years mm -hmm. ahead to fill gaps in our own society. The mm -hmm. gaps in countries that have negative demography are developing already. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, and I should mention that uh, while my mother's parents in Australia were not the children of starvation, they were the children simply of need, my Irish great-grandparents came first to the United States, then to Canada, because literally their family was starving in, in Ireland. Mm -hmm. I always like to remember that when I think of refugees. Refugees aren't them. Refugees are us. Okay. Uh, very profound question. Thank you very much. Yes, perhaps all people might be refugees uh, historically. Any of us can be refugees mm -hmm. at some time in the future. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Such a very philosophical and profound uh, answer, question and answer. Thank you very much. We enjoyed so much uh, two excellent keynote speakers and we learned so much, uh, such an informative uh, lecture and excellent and profound lecture. So um, 
if it possible, please uh, open the video, Glen Fukushima, and uh, people uh, wish to uh, um, group your hands to two excellent uh, presenters. So thank you very much for coming to uh, this conference and uh, thank you very much and please work hard for such uh, persons, uh, refugees or uh, minorities or oppressed people and to make a uh, good governance and uh, beautiful rule, on, rule of law or other and many institutions to make peace and prosperity. So thank really you very much. Fun. I'm sorry that I'm. Uh, it's almost one o'clock in the morning, so I'm getting ready to go to sleep to, to go to bed. <laughs> okay, so so I've already taken my no, next guy off. So <laughs> I, I will keep the. Uh, thank you very much. Off, but thank you very much. I enjoyed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad I never put up. my necktie on. Okay. <laughs> thank, you very much. Um, thank you for such a wonderful talk, by <laughs> Professor. Well, thank you. Uh, it's great to see you again, and look forward to seeing you when I'm in Tokyo. <laughs> Indeed, and thank Professor Haba, thank you yes, for inviting thank you very us. Much. Good night. Thank you very much. Bye. You. Bye. Bye, David Malone. Thank you. Goodbye. So thank you very much for coming. It is really excellent and wonderful presentations. So um, we'd like to close this session and start the next session from uh, four o'clock. So thank you very much for coming. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Arigatou gozaimashita.